Good afternoon. It's uh, an honor to be here. It's uh, 4 o'clock on a Tuesday. Whoa. It's not the most lively intellectual moment in a week. <laughs> so I thought we might begin uh, uh, by playing just a bit. Come with me to Doonesbury. Time to return to the flock. But which church has a decent gym? Alex, honey, mom, and I have been talking, and we've decided it's time for us to start attending church as a family. Church. Church is boring. Well, we thought you might say that. All kids think that. Did you think church was boring when you were a kid? Well, sure, I hated going. <laughs> but church was good for me, so my parents made me stick it out. You may end up hating church, too. <laughs> But you have to come by that feeling honestly. <laughs> you have to put in the pew time, like mom and I did. Oh. What if I like it? <laughs> like it? What do you mean? <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we get there, honey. Uh, I'd like to begin this afternoon with a bit of a... Uh, uh, hermeneutical exercise, uh, I'd like you to uh, visit uh, the uh, metaphors, if there are any, the conceptual frameworks that crystallize around your understanding of the church's work with those in the first third of life. What do you bring into this uh, moment this afternoon uh, by way of your sense of who the church is with those twixt birth and 30, uh, what the church is up to uh, these days with those twixt zero and 30, and uh, with what a, uh, a, a theologically well-informed, strategically well-developed, and uh, appropriately practiced faith might look like with those in the first third of life. Let's turn to someone else, pick up the conversation. It's all right to talk in class. Hang on, to your, hang on to your sensibilities and bring them along uh, into the dialogue. In 1932, Mark Connolly wrote in his play, Green Pastures, uh, everything nailed down is coming loose, 1932. Uh, if that were true then, uh, that most certainly is true today, especially when we look at the frameworks that macro sociologists and social scientists bring to the seasons of human life. Regularly now, unlike Erickson, 
we take a look at the span and uh, divide up the epochs or the periods into threes. First third, first 30 years, second third, next 30 years, last third, the last 30 years, and we divide up those thirds into thirds. In fact, uh, that season of life, which I inhabit now, uh, the old, elder I am, is divided up into thirds, young, old, middle, old, old, old. <laughs> Or as some say, go, go, slow, go, and no, go. <laughs> uh, regularly, as we inhabit those particular times in life, uh, uh, we talk about uh, like 70 is the new 50. <laughs> Excuse me, I know better. But there are some elements of that that are most certainly the case. We can replace parts now. We can get drugs that make even other parts continue to work. <laughs> So there's a, whole new, there's a whole new way or perspective of, of looking at what's happening particularly in the last third of life, but so also the first third. Uh, not long ago, I was in New York City and, and picked up a rag on the street, and its lead article that occupied 11 pages of this particular journal was forever youngish. <laughs> and, as they unpacked the, the first third of life, they said, well, it, it extends for New Yorkers at least into the next decade. And they wondered, as they worked their way through pop culture, through work habits, through expectations, what are, if you will, the milestone markers that in the digital age tell us we have become an adult? Um, would it be, for example, uh, having our own place? Uh, once upon a time, it had to do with putting the big three together, uh, getting married, uh, having a residency, and being able to support oneself. Uh, not necessarily true any longer. So there are, are, are huge changes taking place now as we, we enter carefully, thoughtfully, into the human condition in the first 30 years of life. I want to use this afternoon as we get started simply uh, one dimension of that. And I use it because I think it's become a predominant force in shaping the consciousness and the lifestyle of those. And we're going to take the middle, if you will, piece of the first third of life, those tick twixt 10 and 20, as we pick up the conversation this afternoon. And that device, or that change, is the participation in the turning from the print age to the digital age. Where 500 years ago, Protestantism essentially had its birth in a major turn in communication, the invention of the printing press. We now are alive in a turn from print media, primarily, to, in fact, electronic media, and the dawning of the palm-held communication device that enables a teenager to communicate with anyone, anywhere, at any time, and for others to communicate with them at any time, from anywhere, and almost anyone. The result of all of that is uh, a young person is now uh, not wanting for stimulation. In the agrarian age, young people were regularly bored. I know. I grew up on a tractor in North Dakota. In the industrial age, twixt 12 and 20, time out. The notion of Hall, 1904, teenage years are essentially time out. But what does it mean now to hold in your hand a device that will enable you to make millions of dollars, to be bullied, or, in fact, to be in communication with persons anywhere, anytime, including hacking into security systems. As we think about all of this, one of the things we know as we listen to 13-year-olds, 16-year-olds, is that they are never in want for stimulation. The device is constantly bringing ideas, bits of information, and so on into their own existence. And they, too, have the opportunity to instantaneously, in a variety of ways, respond to others no matter where they are. One of the results of that is that there is very little time in their lives to pause 
and process the data, the information that's arriving, whether they want it or not, that can be sent out because it's asked for. And their lives are deeply taken up in this process. The other day I was walking uh, in a, uh, a senior high school uh, alongside of a 16-year-old uh, uh, who was dressed in a fedora, a black suit, a white shirt, and a narrow 1960s tie. So I sidled up alongside of him. Uh, retro, all right, I'll go back, 60s. And I sidled up alongside of him and uh, sort of looked at him out of the corner of my eye and said, interesting. He looked down at me. He was about six foot six. Looked down at me and said, Landry. The Cowboys. The 60s. I've coached the team better than Tom Landry did. We've won four more games in the 67 season than Tom Landry won. Whereupon we got into a discussion, I out of the best of my memory and he out of a refreshed daily visiting of the capacities of the Cowboys roster, how it was that he was in fact out coaching Landry. I wondered with him how much time he spent at this, he said, well, it depends on what you need to do to get ready for the game. Some of the weeks he was spending 30, 35, 40 hours a week, he's a gamer. But he is more than a gamer. If dress is an expression of one's identity, he had essentially taken on the persona of Tom Landry. So what does it mean to participate in this huge turn in the history of humankind where the processes of communication are profoundly influencing, for example, the development of the frontal lobes of the human brain, which takes place during this particular period of time, which part of the brain is regularly meant to offset the reptilian brain so that a person has the capacities to pause, discern, reason, consider, and so forth. Do we know? What's it like to wonder, explore? But even more difficult, what's it like to be a purveyor of the grand God narrative to a generation that knows Harry Potter almost to a book, to a chapter, to a page, and the characters but has no idea about Abraham and Sarah. How do we do this? What I want to do is I want to think with you uh, about how it is that, that the grand memory that here at Yale University and the grand memory of the formation process in the Anglican tradition, how does one tap that how does one live out of the, the, the parts of that that are not only informing what it means to be a continuing co-creator with God of humankind, but what, is it, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, this one whose life hinges history about whom they know hardly anything? How does one do this when, in fact, the stimuli and the options that they have will give you hardly any time at all, or hardly any access to their lives. What I want to do is I, I want to take you into a, uh, a theological exercise, and I'm going to make an argument this afternoon that at the essence, at the heart of youth ministry, it are several huge theological questions. Ministry in the first third of life is not essentially about models. It's not essentially even about strategies. It's certainly not about entertaining kids. It is about fundamentally the question of where is God, what God are we talking about, and where is this God present and at work? In fact, the, the book that some of you have read a bit of, what we discovered in the 131 congregations from seven tribes that we looked at is that at the center of these congregations and their work with young people was this phenomenon. Whether they were Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, Assemblies of God, and others, 
They were places where God was the subject of sentences, the verbs were present tense and active, and the predicates included a wide variety of communities in which they understood this living, present God to be at work in them, in their communities, through them, out ahead of them, in the world. At the essence of these places of faithful and effective youth ministry was a set of theological convictions. In these places, God wasn't talked about as an artifact of the past just, certainly there, but the memory of who this God was, this God of promise and fulfillment, was alive in their sensibilities of day-to-day -day existence. For example, if one is going to be at work around such theological questions, what matters, of course, is scripture and other texts. To work with the first third of life is to be an exquisite exegete and someone who understands hermeneutics to its finest point. It requires this kind of discipline. It further requires reading living human documents as well as one reads texts. This research is now available to us in exquisite form. Social scientific research has been refined. It's been questioned philosophically. And we have some of the finest ethnographic research available to us in terms of understanding what's going on, for example, in a middle school cafeteria. If you have children, or if you've walked alongside of someone who looked a lot like me in those days, crooked nose, long arm, skinny, wet in my bed until I was in seventh grade, uh, walking into that cafeteria, it was like awesomely, existentially painful. And the way in which that journey of coming alongside of an unfolding human being is understood will make all the difference in the world in terms of the future of that young person. I can tell you from my own experience that it did. But knowing the research is not enough. What's happening now in this context with these particular people and their relationships? That is, taking the capacity out of the research to do as well after one has learned to read an Old Testament text in Hebrew or a New Testament text in Greek it's one thing to know the languages. It's another thing to take those languages into the texts and to become an exquisite exegete. One of your graduates, uh, that uh, Don Jewell, that I had a chance to work with, uh, taught at Princeton for years, uh, had this capacity to take these languages and his erudition and bring it to bear, for example, on the reading of Mark's gospel in ways that brought surprises and best I could tell, the culture of that text alive in the hearers. So with those who have the capacity to take this research and to tend human lives. Um, she, she texted me from her first semester at college. She had, before she went uh, in the fall, and actually two years before, she had searched the web and selected three schools that she would visit as she made the decision about where to go to college. NYU, St. Olaf College in a little place like Northfield, Minnesota, and a place even smaller, Concordia College in Moorhead. Why those three? Picked up off the web. Talked her parents into visiting all three and chose one of them and headed off as a pre-med student to take up study in the fall at the university. She took an array of courses and being a, a conscientious young woman, she did well in all of them. One of them happened to be organic chemistry. <laughs> the sort of weeding out place in medical school. She did well, it was hard work. She happened also to be in an investigative writing course in which she delighted. So I get this tweet, Grandpa, can we talk? So just after she had been home for 
the holidays, we met over dinner and started a conversation that went on for two and a half hours. I was never sure whether I was talking with a 45-year-old or a 16-year-old or her 19-year-old self. But here's the conversation. I had to work hard at chemistry. I found little excitement there. I'm thinking, is she a wimp? Is she giving up too easily? Uh, when I did my investigative journalism class, writing class, I, I had this vision of Anderson Cooper. And I mean, who wouldn't, maybe, huh? <laughs> And the delight of, of, of doing what he, do, what he does and making a difference. You see, she want wanted to be a doctor so she could work in Doctors Without Borders. And she discovered, as I listened to her, that she was not practicing medicine or going to practice medicine because she loved and was excited about the functioning of the human body and the process of its healing. But she was passionate about making a difference in the world in the world, in the big world. So I became a, an elder dumb shit. Sorry. Uh, uh, I listened. Uh, I followed her language, uh, picking up uh, the, if you will, the storyline. I could, I could see her talk about organic chemistry with a kind of, if you will, forceness. I saw her come alive when she talked about investigative writing. And so I played back to her what I was hearing. And I watched the turn. She said to me, so now how do I deal with all those to whom I've said I'm going to study medicine? I mean, it's not easy when everyone has said, oh, you're going to be a doctor. NYU is a great place to go and study medicine. And now, already so early in the journey to be turning the corner. And we had tested out whether she was a wimp or not and where her passion lay. So I asked her this question. So who's told you, who's told you that to change your mind early on in the journey of education is, in fact, something that is either lesser or something that means one can't, in fact, stay the course. She was silent. She looked at me and said, I did. And so we looked at each other a long time and wondered I asked her, so how would you know if you could say to yourself, it's OK to let go of one dream and embrace another? She looked at me and said, you're enough, Grandpa. This is youth ministry. And as a priest, you will bring erudition. You will bring the capacity to read texts. You will bring the capacity to read living human documents to those moments. And you will have the grand opportunity to accompany 10-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 19-year-olds in these turnings. I don't think there's ever been a time when the memory, the great memory that drives us, the grand God narrative, and the existential questions of a generation has been as poignant as it is now. So uh, let's become uh, uh, authoritative theological actors. Guys on the text. Uh, I want to come back to this uh, process of, of theological action, or I call it uh, theological, existential, and practical performative congruence. Let me say that again. Okay? Uh, young people have crap detectors 85,000 miles long. They'll pick up crap very quickly. And so what, what they oftentimes do is they put together is what you're saying about God, 
One young person said to me, since when is God a three-syllable word? <laughs> what you're saying about God and who God is and where God is at work, what you are in fact up to in your practices as a priest, and the way you are, your being, they're asking, is there performative congruence? Is your theology integrative? Do you have big ideas? And do they hang together? Can you support them? Do you, in fact, as you think about practices, do those practices reflect those big ideas? And as you live in the culture of those big ideas and those practices, does who you are match what it is you say in terms of what you believe? Performative congruence. When they see big ideas, strategies, or practices, and being come together, you become a, mag a magnet. They're drawn to that kind of big idea authenticity. With that, uh, I want to put together in this process uh, three moves this afternoon quickly. Faith stories. Can we, in fact, set alongside of Harry Potter and others? Grand, the grand God narrative in such a way that it has traction, both in terms of their imagination and their sense of this story calls life as it sees it. Rowley's work does at least two things. It's full of danger and pain and hurt and risk, life with its dark side. And it provides opportunity for struggle and you have the struggle for good and evil and fantasy and imagination and mystery everywhere. We flattened our story. She had to write one to replace it, and it's replaced it in a powerful, powerful way in their lives. Let's ask, how does the Grand God narrative come up alongside of the existential questions in that middle decade of the first third of life and what is it that we make and know by way of Christ's claims in our practices? How do we put those together in a way that matters for those in the first third of life? So uh, let's take up a text. Uh, I encourage you to uh, take up your craft. Uh, of course, there's so much here. Uh, but I invite you with another person or two to at least interpret one item of the text. One item of the text. I chose this text because I have a sense that there are some similarities uh, to Athens and the world in which you live. Uh, there are certainly some similarities to Athens and the world in which I live. And there are, if you will, some dynamics, I think, going on around us that are, were, in fact, going on uh, around Paul. In fact, some say that ours is a time not so dissimilar from the apostolic age. So uh, exercise your capacities, turn to one another, and pick up some interpretation here. What do you see in this text? Interpret this text. Whoa, 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 enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you do this every day. Uh, it's amazing uh, to think about uh, how critical uh, your craft is, if these narratives are going to be something other than flat for young people. Uh, th there's, there's no simple reading of a text. And, and the work that you're doing here will, in fact, open up the texture, the richness of the grand God narrative. Now, as I look at this, th there's some interesting little pieces that just jump off the page for me. While Paul was waiting, uh, Paul was hanging out. <laughs> he was just hanging out. And uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that he's both arguing uh, with the devout in the synagogue, and he's also out carrying on discourse with those in the marketplace. Uh, I'm coming out of Melbourne, Australia on a 747 on my way back to Los Angeles. Uh, we get in the, in the air, and about an hour and a half into the, uh, uh, into the flight, they serve us a meal to put us to sleep the rest of the way. Uh, when the meal comes, after some small talk with the person who's sitting next to me, I turn to him and say, so, do you go to church? 
Uh, captive audience, huh? He's belted in. <laughs> so he looked, at, he looked back at me and said, funny you should ask, we, we just quit. So I said, you, you, none of my business, but uh, uh, do you mind telling me why you quit? Yeah, I said, uh, I'm a consultant, a Fortune 500 consultant. I've just come out of uh, Australia brokering a major agreement between a mining, an iron mining uh, firm in Australia and a foundry in Red China. Interesting, he used the term, China. Huh? Uh, then he said to me, when I'm at work in what I do regularly, there are huge ethical issues that are on the table, and I know it, and I have no idea how to think complexly about what is taking place. I go to church on Sunday morning hoping that the discourse will inform my work. Uh, six weeks ago, we came home, he said, and uh, from, the, from worship, we looked at one another, the two children and uh, my wife and I, and asked, what just happened? <laughs> and we started by saying, I don't think we made a difference in anyone's life, and it didn't, we know, make a difference in our lives, coloring pictures in Sunday school, didn't do it. And so we decided our lives were too busy and we quit. So I said, uh, he wasn't an Episcopalian nor a Lutheran, I want you to know that. Uh, so I said, hey, did you talk to your pastor? He said, no, why would I do that? I said, well, I think your, 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 I think your pastor deserves to be heard from, th th to hear you. He said, he looked at me and said, so who are you? <laughs> I told him, I'm a God guy. And I fuss with the faithfulness and effectiveness of pastors. So I said, whatever it's worth, go see him. And I gave him my card and invited him to contact me. I thought, it's one of those airplane conversations I'll never hear from him again. About two months later, I got a call. This is Steve from Long Beach. I said, Steve? He said, yeah, remember the airplane ride? I said, oh, yeah. I went to see my pastor, and he listened to me. And then he said to me, two weeks' time, I want to interview you during my sermon. So he interviewed him. And in the sermon, Steve said, I come here regularly, and you speak in a language no one understands from a point of view that doesn't make a difference about that which doesn't matter. And of course, he was, he was a great Presbyterian pastor. <laughs> he was. He was. I, I, I had a chance to talk to him. But he was, in fact, he was, in fact, not a translator he was not a translator, Steve told him. And to his credit, he said to Steve, I need you. I need you. He interviewed him during the course of the sermon. After the sermon, 13 people came up to the pastor and to Steve and said, you just named our experience. So Steve and his pastor started an inquiry group and they've called themselves getting at that which matters from a point of view that makes a difference in a language that we can understand. <laughs> uh, this is the case, largely the case, with young men and women. Uh, so here we have Paul, an observer, a listener, a babbler. But then what he's done through being in the marketplace He's piqued their curiosity, so they haul him, they haul him to a place where they're having dialogue, and he's noticed, he's noticed to an unknown God. I noticed last weekend, I wondered about this huge temple, the stadium in Indianapolis, about this huge ritual, the Super Bowl game, about the proclaiming of the good news, all the ads, and which one is better than the other and millions of dollars spent to put them on. Uh, 
I took up a conversation with someone who had spent the whole weekend with the ritual of getting the food and into all of this. And I interviewed him about his experience worshiping. It was fascinating. And then I noticed in this text that Paul puts out in front of them a articulation of God in language that's hardly gilded at all. The God in whom we live and move and have our being. I want to suggest that that sounds a whole lot like what I've discovered in the lives of every person I've talked to, 10 to 20. I want to make an argument today that adolescence is not primarily an emotional journey, although it is an emotional journey. It's not primarily a physical journey, although it is a physical journey, secondary sex characteristics, other kinds of things going on. That it is a cognitive journey, but not just, not primarily, that adolescence is essentially an existential journey. And here's how I know. The young people that I've studied over the last 40 years, every one of them that I've come up alongside of is asking the question, what's it like to be me? What's it like to inhabit my own skin? How do I understand my body image? Uh, we have a whole industry, uh, consumer culture, that sells them images in the clothes they buy, torn jeans for $60 a pair. There's a whole industry built around this existential process. We, we have metaphors about what it's like to be a woman, some of them just exceedingly awful. I grew up with Barbie, or Ken, or G.I. Joe, or whatever. There's an incredible journey that's taking place here and people who can help young people come up inside of who they are in an authentic way are, in fact, exceedingly valuable. What's it like to fit in? Where do I belong? Can you trust anyone? Who knows how to hold up their end of the stick as a friend? Can you be on, if you will, friending processes on Facebook and not get bashed or bullied? Texting and meaning making. How does one work with the bites of the digital age in such a way that they get arranged in layers of priority in terms of what matters and what doesn't? I just farted. You need to know. <laughs> I had red licorice for dinner today. You need to know. I'm a celebrity. I'll put myself out there. Uh, how, does, how does one work in the process of taking the bits of texting and, and arranging them in some kind of way that says, in the 117,000 things that I could be doing, these I do and these I don't do? Uh, if all of that's going to work, we know that it needs to become a narrative. Who's helping them story their lives? Who will, who will find a way to say, whoa, whoa, let's put stimuli on pause, and let's sit for two and a half hours and have dinner just after having returned from Christmas vacation and tend the question of, in the turn, do I continue in medicine because I said I was going to do it, but do I follow my discoveries and my passion? And in the process, I learned that she'd left home. Good family, loves her sister, mother and father. But when she went home over Christmas, something was different. She had become soulmates with three young women at the university and discovered that she'd been launched. And now she was wondering, what's it like to live in this new space in its riskiness, in making one's own way, pioneering the life that is this unfolding young woman. And so we fussed 
with her storyline. What's yours? How does the grand God narrative come up alongside of it? What are the storylines that will, in fact, inform a living future in a vulcanized world that's busting itself up on each other's differences? These kids are not into greening by accident. They're wanting to know, will this home, in fact, be around to support them? Making a difference. One of the things we know is this generation is deeply engaged in mission trips, wanting to get involved and roll up their sleeves and make a difference. I spent a lot of my time in youth ministry with Generation X, Kurt Corbain, cynicism. That's not this generation. There's a whole different way of picking up the world. There's a hopefulness. There's a sense I can make a difference. Sometimes too grandiose, but they pick it up usually one task at a time. It's amazing. Living stressed, for sure they live stressed, and they're going to live stressed the rest of their lives. How to find balance in this incredible sea and river of stuff that comes at them. And they soon learn there's no way to control it all. One of, the great, one of the great impacts I've discovered from listening to my grandkids and others in the work of Harry Potter is that what she has done in those texts is to open up to them an opportunity to work the question of how do you deal with the unknown? How do you face the unknown? She's become a billionaire doing what our calling has, in fact, set up for us across the generations. Uh, let me go one last place as we finish. And here I want to introduce, I didn't spend purposely today much time in this because I've been told you've had a chance to get at some of it and read it. Let me introduce the study just briefly uh, so we can then get into dialogue with one another. Uh, here's what we found in the 131 congregations in seven tribes. They were Roman Catholic, United Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Lutheran, uh, Southern Baptist, uh, Mission Covenant, and Assemblies of God. Someone said to us when we started, it sounds like a bad joke. Uh, it was, in fact, an interesting investigative enterprise. One of the largest studies of its kind that's been done, 6,000 responses. I've never worked so hard to get a strong response from all of these people in terms of setting up the calls and so on. It was a wonderful gift that they gave us. Here's what we learned, that it wasn't in models, it wasn't in practices per se that the genius of these communities lay, it was in the spirit of these communities. What do I mean by that? Their sense of authenticity, their sense of hopefulness born out of a performative congruence with the, with the great tradition. So for example, uh, one young woman said to me, uh, when I asked her, why are you hanging around church? You're 17 years old. By this time, uh, most young people have disengaged. Why are you here? She said, well, it's true. Most of my friends aren't. I come from a good family. I'm in a strong school. But I'm here because this place messes with my life. So I said, what do you mean by that? She said, people here look into my face as though I am actually here. And she said, when they look into my face, they see things in me that I don't know exist. They see things in me that I don't know exist. And they call them out. They call them out of me. And they provide opportunities in this community for me to participate with all the other generations in doing that which matters. Sometimes I fail. Sometimes discovered, I discover I can learn things that I can't learn any other place. She said, this place is calling me into someone I didn't know I could ever be. Sounds to me like a baptismal theology. Sounds to me like a sacramental life. It sounds to me like a person who's living into the destiny that we know comes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
sounds to me like this community has gotten it, that creation didn't happen just once, but that co-creation, we've been invited into the process of co-creating each other. This young woman was giving expression to a culture, not a program, an intergenerational spirit of hopefulness, honesty, authenticity. If it matters, it matters. If it doesn't, they'll disengage. Their lives are too full. Living active presence of God, I've spoken about this. Uh, the, the, the major theological watershed in these congregations was they had a sense that, th that this God who is in the grand God narrative, yes, has been at work in the past, but yes, is now also at work in the present. And so you could pick it up by studying the language of the people. It was an ethnographic exercise, we noticed. They talked about God as the subject of sentences. The verbs were present tense, they were active, and the predicates included them, the community, the world. They saw God expansively at work in the world. At the heart of this effective practice of ministry in the first third of life was a deep, abiding, reformation, theological commitment. Followers of Jesus Christ, uh, these people spend a lot of time participating in Christ's presence in the body. Someone said uh, to me, I didn't know that uh, forgiveness of sins had to do with contrition, confession, absolution, restoration of life, and amendment of life. I thought, oh my God, this person has been studying Thomas. <laughs> I, I don't know, I can't tell you how long I was a Lutheran we're big on confession and forgiveness, huh? Huge, huh? And here was a young person saying to me, you know, this stuff has to do with attitudes, it has to do with honest speech, it has to do with being pronounced free of it all, it has to do with then looking at how what's been going on before can in fact be addressed, really? And it has to do finally with the transformation of life itself, amendment of life. This is the performative congruence that these young people were discovering in these communities, if you will, of confession and absolution, amendment of life, etc. cetera. Uh, life is transformed. Uh, they discovered, uh, a, a young man said to me, <coughs> skinny, uh, acne, huge, uh, colorful uh, a stocking cap, uh, pants hanging down so you could see the crack in his butt. Uh, he said, I didn't know that I've got the heartbeat of resurrection in me. <laughs> Excuse me. He said, I'm a drummer. Yeah. And uh, some person had discovered him in a garage and had brought him in alongside the grand piano as the percussionist in the music and the worship service. He said, have you ever, do you know Berlois' Requiem Mass? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, do you know, do you know it has, it, it has a, a, a beat of, of taking you down into the depths and bringing you out into new places? He was 16. Changed his life. His drumming his drumming is a whole other enterprise. It's a vocation. Uh, he knows how to lead worship because it's about God and it's about his gift and the community's gifts. Young people enfranchised. Uh, these were young people who were brought into leadership. One of the stories was really fascinating. Uh, in one of the congregations in Nishwa, Minnesota, a little town up north in the woods, a, uh, uh, a, a patriarch, geek, I didn't know there were such. Uh, an elder who had worked for a major IT company retired and moved to this little town. He went to church in this small church and, uh, and said, you know, uh, uh, my wife is ill. 
And I would like uh, to uh, record the worship services, video the worship services, bring them home to her. So he, established, he, he, he sat with a camera. It was some seventh grader saw him uh, holding the camera and said, you know, we could mount those cameras and they can be run by remotes. We could put two cameras and we could have a, a much better, if you will, experience of the service for your wife. So the seventh grader and the 72-year-old colluded. Pretty soon they had seven cameras. They were all running. <laughs> they, they were all running from remotes. And rather than just focusing on the presider and the preacher and others, they were now focusing on people's faces in the congregation, some of whom were sleeping. <laughs> he, the, the young guy had a friend who had a program that could edit. And so they started editing this. And they discovered that the local, ca uh, uh, the, the local cable television network would give them free television time between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning. So they started putting the worship services on television at 2 o'clock in the morning. And soon, insomniacs started showing up at church. <laughs> People who couldn't sleep in the night. And they came, and one of them came and said, you're way better on television than you are in person. So the, 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 the patriarch got on the church council, the par came to the parish council and said, you need to see what you look like when we edit you. <laughs> and you need, to hear, you need to hear what people have said. They transformed, if you will, the ritual of the congregation to make it crisp, hospitable, meaningful, so on. They're now on at 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. Not so many people awake then either. <laughs> but they've opened up this church to the community. Why? Uh, because uh, these young people have been enfranchised. It's been going on for nine years. The 72-year-old is now 81, and he is graduates. They write him from colleges and universities across the country. Guess whose spirit is expanded? This retired IT guy who said to me, I think I've really found my calling. This is what the body of Christ, I think, in Galatians 4 and in 1 Corinthians looks like, I think. Uh, these places are turned to face toward the world. Uh, I would put it this way. They understand that what they're doing together in the ministry of the first third of life is done on behalf of the whole church for the sake of the world. It's done on behalf of the whole church for the sake of the world. It's not some little thing off on the side. Their participation in the baptized is done for the sake of the enrichment of the whole church. But it's not just for the sake of the church being proper, but it's so the church can give itself away. These places turn and face the world. And they face the world in at least two really interesting, maybe three ways. One is martyria. Come over here and see what's going on in this community. People go out and speak about what they've experienced in this transformative place. And they go out and pick up justice and service in this, in this process. These people have a sense that they're much larger than Christ Episcopal Church on the corner. They are, in fact, engaged in co-creation, in reconciliation, and in making all things new. All of this is e essentially worked out, finally, by what I would call inspirited leadership. Coming out of the research project, here's how I would put it. As congregations go, so goes the church. That's not congregationalism. It's about understanding communities of faith as the roots of the church Catholic. As congregations go, so go the, goes the church. As leaders go, so go congregations. As leaders go, so go congregations. And in, in these churches, the prime first third of life leader was the theological perspective and the strategic sense of the pastor. The first 
most important first third of life person in the leadership is the pastor. Almost none of them were teaching Sunday school. Almost none of them were doing lock-ins. But they set the tone. They were the theologic, resident theologian in terms of setting the pace for what was going on with designated youth workers, parents, young people themselves. This leadership was absolutely critical in terms of what was happening. Well, it's enough. Uh, you've listened on this late afternoon to uh, an elder who's so full of this. I've spent um, my life working at all of this. And this study was, for me, one of the most uh, interesting, jarring at times, and learning experiences uh, I had opportunity to do. Uh, I, it's, uh, it's about uh, nine, ten minutes after. I think we can go another ten minutes or so. I'm wondering, are there any questions right off the that you might want to ask.